start, I'd love to hear you talk about why you decided to make this film at this point. Uh, the story, I think, I remember reading about this years ago. I guess it came out in the late 90s. That yeah, yeah. Been, did you read Bombshell? I did not. But you I re remember, I remember you, hearing it about was it. In the, yeah, yeah, it was in the news. But what prompted you to want to <clears throat> dig into this as a, as a film right now? Well, I did not hear about it in the 90s. Um, I don't know why, but I didn't. And I, did, I knew nothing about Ted, but um, the uh, one of the producers of the film was a guy named Dave Lindorf, who was an investigative journalist by uh, trade. And he wrote a uh, he wrote a piece about Ted for Counterpunch magazine, which is a left, very left-leaning <laughs> uh, periodical. And Joan saw it and wrote uh, Dave and said she was moved by it, and, and they kind of struck up a little bit of a friendship, and, and that led to Dave thinking, I think there's a film here. Um, and I had interviewed Dave in Abacus. He was uh, he was a uh, an interview subject in that film because he was an investigative journalist. And I think because I was the only filmmaker he knew, he reached out to me and said, "What do you think about making a film about it?" You know, thank God he didn't know, you know, Alex Gibney or you know, those other guys. But <clears throat> so no. But he reached out and he said, "I think there's a film here." And that led to us going to Cambridge, England, and spending four days with Joan and her daughters. And you know, that primary interview was all from that first shoot. And I was just, you know, I was like, I think that at the very least, there's a short film here where Joan just sort of tells these stories in some way, and we find some way to visualize them. Um, but then when she brought out these tapes of Ted. Um, that you see featured in here, and I was like, oh my god, he talks about this. Then I was like, okay, well, let's, I think there's a feature doc here. Wow. So that footage of him being interviewed, that with her, that was, that was her private collection. It had yeah, that, so there's three interviews that appear with, of Ted. One is with Joan, um, and they, they recorded that with a lawyer for posterity, mm -hmm. a lawyer friend. Uh, he, he's still alive. Um, but he's very advanced in age, and when it came time to try to locate the original tape, he couldn't find it. Um, so we had to go with the VHS, but it's, it's okay. Um, and then there was an interview with Ted sitting on a couch, which is a very brief interview, he's kind of looking up at him. That was done mm -hmm. by an activist, uh, new anti-nuke activist. And then, in a, in a, well, the, I think the interview with Ted and Joan is kind of a mother load, but an, an, an additional mother load, you might say, is that CNN BBC interview with Ted where he's sitting with the piano behind him. And they had this copy that was like a three hour interview. They had VHS with time code burn in. And I basically I think what happened is when they when they agreed to do that interview, they said, We want a copy of it for our own purposes. And so they got it. And when I saw that, when I got back to Chicago and started to look at that, I was like, oh my God, this is like amazing. Uh, and so we were really fortunate to have that material of Ted to, because to, to really, so he could speak for himself. It's, it's amazing footage, all of it. And he's so fully present and just, you know, his personality and values and everything yeah. come through so clearly. Yeah, thank you. Um, so, but the the interview with Joan you did before seeing any of that? Yeah, that was the like first the, interview. Then incredible. we went, so then, that was in 2019, and then we went back uh, in um, 2021 after COVID had kind of, was it was possible to go back and did the second interview that you see featured. but. Yeah, I mean, I read I read Bombshell the book before mm -hmm. I went over, um, so I, I really kind of tried to educate myself as much as possible. But it, we interviewed her over the course of three days. I made her wear the same clothes uh, for three <laughs> days straight, um, and I but I, you know I was showing some sensitivity. I didn't want to make her do like a fourteen hour interview in one day. So you know I'm not that bad, but <laughs> but. You know, we we spread it over three days, and I probably talked to her a total of yeah, twelve or thirteen hours over wow. those three days. Amazing. Yeah, she had tremendous stamina. I mean, she was ninety-one, 
Uh, when that interview happened, she was 93 when the second interview happened. And she passed away a few weeks ago. Oh. Oh. Yeah. Did she get a chance to see the film? She did. Um, you know, I wanted this film premiered at Venice, and I wanted her to make the trip to Venice, but she said, I cannot do that. Um, but then um, the Cambridge Film Festival in Great Britain wanted it, which is where she lives. So we had a really great screening at that festival. It's a small festival, but she was able to go. She had all her family there, not just her two daughters, but, you know, their kids and grandkids and extended family and friends from the community. So it was a really great, and it was a really satisfying uh, experience for her. And, you know, as she got more and more ill, she, she you know, she would email me to say how much she was so glad that this story got told. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Yeah. Um, I so you you talk about this in the film, of course, but I just I still want to ask you about a little bit about Ted. Um, first, just starting with the fact that he went to Los Alamos at eighteen. Like, yeah. I, I mean, he. <laughs> and I know he came from an extraordinary family. He was obviously very bright. But how does that? How does like, that happen? How How do you get to be? Like, why did Los Alamos want young physicists like that? Or, or, and how yeah. did he have some specialty as an 18, 19 year old where they're like, we need this kid to come? No, I mean, he, uh, no. So I think basically what happened is, is that the, the recruiters for Los Alamos, um, you know, they had all the most amazing scientists in the world going to Los Alamos. And, but they also needed, you know, they needed some junior physicists to, you know, to do what junior physicists do. So they went to, um, they went to Harvard and they went to the University of Chicago. And they, they, they went to the, the, you know, the physics department or whatever and they said, give me the names of the very best people you have here and we want to talk to them. And Ted was one of those people, even though he was 18 and graduating from Harvard. I mean, the thing about Ted that, really just blew me away, all of it blows me away about how smart he was. But it, where you really, where for me it really hit home was, you know, when early in the film, uh, Joan and Ruth and Sarah are reading some letters that Ted wrote to his brother from Harvard when he was 16 and 17. And he's basically telling them, telling uh, Ed, his brother, everything that's wrong with Harvard as an educational institution. Mm -hmm. And he's like 16 or 17. <laughs> and he's right. You know, he's right. Yeah. He's talking about how they just want to spew out stuff that's not really engaged in learning. It's just nice. memorize and, you know, it's yeah. like, and this is a, you know, this is someone you would think would be just totally enamored, like, I'm at Harvard. He wasn't that way. Right. And, you know, I think that, sensibility carried over to Los Alamos. It's like for all of the headiness of being mm -hmm. at Los Alamos around all of these amazing scientists working on the most ambitious and at the time they were thinking the most important scientific endeavor in the history of humankind. He at an 18 and 19 year old was like, I don't know if this is right, what we're doing here, yeah, or what are the implications of all this? He just—that's the way he thought, right? So when you started the project, was that? I mean, I can understand how, as a filmmaker, this would learning about this story would be kind of catnip of like, yeah, oh my God, this yeah. kid at Los Alamos. But was the idea of like his moral and political awakening kind of central? To, like when you started this, you're like, this is going to be a story about a guy who had doubts about what he was doing or didn't, you know. Yeah, I mean. What was the seed that sort of attracted you? Well, I think the seed, the initial seed was, how does an 18 or 19 year old take such a step? Mm -hmm. I mean, how does that happen? Who is that guy, you know, that's, right. that did that? I mean, has everybody seen Oppenheimer yet? Yeah. Next week. Yeah. Next next week, yeah, we got tickets. Yeah, I won't yeah. spoil it for you. Yeah. <laughs> but you know, Oppenheimer is presented in the Christopher Nolan film, and I think it's and I, and I believe it's accurate. Um, he really didn't 
come to a, a kind of realization of what they had done and what the, the, the possibly terrible realities and implications of it were until after the bombs were dropped in Hiroshima and Nagasaki, right? Mm -hmm. Ted came to this a year into the research mm -hmm. at Los Alamos before they'd even tested the Trinity bomb. He was thinking that way. Um, and he was, he was 18 and 19. So, so yeah, I was right. very interested in like, how does, who is that guy mm -hmm. that does that? How does he do that? And, and knowing, you know, that there were some inherent contradictions in, in what he did because, you know, that the Soviet Union, despite being allies, you know, Stalin was <laughs> Stalin um, and, and wanting to, to sort of understand that. But I have to say that meeting Joan was really the thing that sealed the deal and spending time with her because I just thought, I didn't come over here thinking that this was a profound love story. But I left there thinking this is a this is an incredible love story on top of everything else that it is, you know, and that and I wanted I wanted what excited me about doing the film was to not have a bunch of experts, you know. I, I felt like I had mm -hmm. to have a few to give credence to what they said, so that the you the audience wouldn't be going, oh, I don't know about that, you know, um, but. I really wanted it to be a personal story and a love story at the heart of this. And for the longest time, the title was going to be Ted and Joe. Mm -hmm. Do you like that title better? Yeah. Yeah. yeah, I did too. But I kind of got, I, I normally, I title my films and I normally, and that's what they are. But in this case, I got such pushback from, from all my colleagues and the folks that participated, it was like, no, oh, we don't think that's the right title that I, I caved. And I'm happy with this title, but, but, I, but I wanted to call it Ted and Joe. But as the film goes on, it blossoms, and it is this beautiful romance, but also it's a story of a family. Yeah. And I just thought, it, like, getting to know the kids, yeah. and Joan especially, I thought it was amazing. And right. how, like, the personal and the political are totally woven throughout in a way that felt very lived and... Thank you. And real, and beyond just a story of, like a man grappling with his conscience, right? Which it, which it also is. Yeah, and and a geopolitical story and a spy story and whatever. Yes, and I and that that was vitally important to me, and it's one of the reasons why, you know, I wanted I I've, I've never done any kind of recreations in a doc before, um, you know, um, but I felt like this was a film that, that could really use that because I really, uh, first of all, the, the specificity of the stories that both Joan and Ted from the grave essentially are telling mm -hmm. were such that I don't know how I could visually bring them to life unless mm -hmm. I did this. So there was that, but there was also that they did this when they were so young mm -hmm. that I really wanted you did not forget, you know, you've got this 91-year-old woman speaking to you and you've got, Ted was in his 70s when he did that interview. It's like, these are not, they, they didn't do this as older people. They did this as teenagers and in their early 20s and she, you know. So I really didn't, I, I really wanted that to be continually present as well as to underscore the love story. Mm -hmm. Can you, going back to Joan for a moment, can you talk about, I, um, I mean, this is sort of a process question yeah. of, of how you approach filmmaking, but with Joan, how did you go about um, interviewing her, having that conversation on camera? Like, when, when you, you just met her, right. can you just talk about how, you're, how you work in that situation, how you right. gain her trust, or, or maybe it was just there from the beginning, but... It, it, How you yeah, it wasn't there from the beginning, which was it was interesting in this case. I mean, um, she really trusted Dave, and he was there, so that helped because she had befriended Dave, the producer, uh, who originated the whole thing. So that that helped. I was with Dave, so that helped. Mm -hmm. um, but the first day, it was interesting because you know there have been various attempts over the years to try and do something with this with his story that have kind of come to nothing, right? Um, and 
so I started asking questions, and and she, and the first day she was like, "Oh, I don't want to tell that story." <laughs> you know, I was like, "Well, tell them I kind of need you to tell that story." <laughs> <laughs> you know, and so I try to be patient and and humor her. I mean, one of my, you know, techniques is to try to deploy humor with subjects, even in the most serious films, because, you know, it's a way of trying to sort of connect. Mm -hmm. um, every once in a while you encounter someone who's humorless, and then <laughs> so I, I, I stop with the humor, but most people are not humorless. So, so you know, I, I really try to connect in a very human way, um, and it, but that first day wasn't, you know, it was, it wasn't rocky or terrible. There were good things that happened, but it was, it was much more sort of, a bit of a sparring and dance. And, but by the second day, she, I think she had given herself over to it, and and she had kind of realized that, what we were doing, that that our interests were truly genuine in what we were trying to do, and and she just warmed to the idea of reliving it, you know, mm -hmm. um, because it was such an incredible part of her life, and. And so then it proceeded from there. And then in the interim, you know, between that first interview and the second interview, I was in regular contact with her for any number of reasons related to I started to edit or I needed to know things or we needed to collect pictures, more pictures. And so the relationship got further built mm -hmm. so that by the time I went back for the second interview, she was like really thrilled to see me. Uh -huh. <laughs> you know, it was yeah. like, oh, hi, you know, so, yeah. so I think, you know, with every film it's different, the trust building thing, sometimes it takes months, sometimes it happens more instantly, um, in this case, luckily, it, it did happen more quickly because we didn't have the wherewithal to just go and live in Cambridge for right. several months. And this is a very nitty gritty question, but can yeah. I, like, where do you sit in relation? Do you sit close to her, like in front of the camera, where the camera's behind yeah, you? So, you? Yeah, the camera, the lens is usually like right here, and the tripod's there, and I make sure my chair is in front of that, mm -hmm. so that I'm the primary focus. Okay. Uh, I tend to sit pretty close to the lens, but, um, uh, but, but yeah, I try to be, you know, like if you were Joan, I try to be about, you know, somewhere in here. Uh -huh. Not too far away, not... Right, uh, inner space. <laughs> yeah, but um, but just a comfortable, intimate distance. Yeah. I mean, she seemed very. She's obviously t an incredible storyteller, oh, yes. and and enjoyed. It felt like she enjoyed having those memories she did. with you. Yeah. Um, yeah. She. She. Yeah. She just. I just was like, wow. I could. She's one of those people that I could just sit there and listen to all day long. You know. Um, she's that engaged and animated and expressive. Um, that's who she is. You know, one of the one of the critics who who you know gave me a positive review overall. But um, I don't want to single them out by name. But <laughs> <they're good. laughs> uh, you know, didn't you know? Didn't like the recreation so much, which you. Know, I, I knew I was going to hear that. That you hear that a lot with any time you try to do that. Um, but he he said in his review, he said, "Joan is such an amazing interview. I could have just listened to her and see her speak for the entire film." And I'm like, "I could do that too. I don't know that anyone would get to watch that, but <laughs> yes, you know, she's, yeah, yeah, she is that good. But, yeah, but you know, it's kind of tough to get a film like that." In distribution, yeah, <laughs> yeah. May, may I? If, um, I was a little surprised to hear that she was reluctant because, just as an audience member hearing her speak, I felt like she wanted. This was a story she did not want to take to a grave. Absolutely, no. You're right. I think her reluctance at the beginning had more to do with, you know, she w wanting to make sure that this was the right decision to tell this story to us. And the fact that there had been some various attempts over the years to do this, so she had told some of these some of these stories before and nothing came of it, and so it was almost like, okay, 
is this going to be another one of those situations where I tell some of these stories and then, you know, they go off and then nothing right. ever gets made. It was more that than a, than a reluctance to want to share the story itself. Once, and once she got going, then she was, yeah, it was, it was great. Could you also talk about the, I thought the, the kids, the grown children yeah. were amazing. The two daughters, their daughters, and then Boria and uh, Boria Sarah. was yeah. incredible. Yeah. And I love the fact that he had, he was not a fan of what no. two men had done. Right? Exactly. I, I mean, that was, I wasn't expecting that. I was, it was so, I don't know, it was really compelling. Yeah. But, but they also all, they seemed to have, I don't know, there was something different about them on screen. Like, especially the two women, they seemed a little, not leery, but they seemed mm -hmm. incredibly thoughtful and smart and thinking through what they were saying, but conflicted or, or something. Uh, no, right? you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, I think what you picked up is absolutely right. I mean, I think Ruth uh, Ruth was less so than Sarah. Sarah's the one, um, you know, who tells the story about how she found out and then everything kind of fell into place uh, near the end of the film. Sarah is, a, is an extremely shy and quiet person and she really, she really didn't want um, she, she really didn't want to be in it. And I kind of convinced her to be part of that sitting around the table. Um, and she did it. And so there was this one, I mean, this is, so the moment where she cries that you see in the film, uh, you know, when that happened when we were filming, um, she said to me, I don't want that in the film. And I said, like most every filmmaker in that situation. Um, I hear you, we'll, 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 let's just see, you know, we'll talk about it and let's, you know, let's, you know, it's like it's too early to make those kind of decisions. But, but, but I told her then, which I will we'll do in this situation, because you, because people need it. It's, I told her, I said, but if you, at the end of the day, if you really, really, really don't want it in, then I will take it out, which made her feel better. I had no intention of no, taking it out that. if I could have <laughs> any say in that. But that became, you know, and, a lot, and that's happened before, and us usually when people then see it in the context of an edited film, then they're, they're comforted enough and they're fine and they're, they, it's not a big issue anymore. Usually. Not in this case. She was like, remember you said you'd take that out. Uh -huh. <laughs> So there was a lot of back and forth on that, and because I felt like I would, I would have ultimately, but I didn't immediately go, okay, it's out. Um, I really tried to get to the bottom of what it was that was really bothering her by having that in the film, and and what it came down to was um, ultimately was this feeling that um, you know, that people would look at her and think she was weak. Um, and I was like, no, no, people aren't going to look at it this way, you know? People are going to look at this and see love and see this dawning realization of what your life had really been that you didn't, you know, but what you get from the scene, right? I just had to kind of walk her through that and that helped, and, and at a certain point, she she relented, <laughs> and it's and it's in the mm -hmm. film. I did have to trim it back some, and I did I, mm -hmm. I tried to meet her halfway with some stuff. I trimmed some stuff back, but she finally agreed to it. And and I think now to this day, I mean, she's fine with it. You know, she's and she's happy with the film, and she's she's not sorry that she participated. But but it was touch and go, and uh, and that's not uncommon. You know. Um, that's kind of part of my job, is to talk people into things they don't want to do. I wanted this to, to always be a story through the lens, the most personal lens that we could possibly bring to it. Whether it was Ted and Joan's marriage or their families. Um, because I, I feel like that's, that's where the heart and soul of this story lies. And, you know, there, there, there are a lot of you could easily make a film about what Ted did that doesn't get into any of that, because it's certainly dramatic enough mm -hmm. um, what what he did. But 
Oops, sorry, that should have been off. Um, but uh, but that wasn't what interested me, and that's not what initially um, drew me to the story. What drew me to the story was that personal. Yeah. I mean, his story drew me, but what made me like, okay, there's, I think there's a really interesting film here. Mm -hmm. Is that, you know? So you've mentioned the the recreations. This is the first time you've done that in a, in a documentary. Yeah. Um, could you talk a bit about? how you did it, and when did you decide to include recreations, and how did you decide what scenes you needed to capture? Was that after you, had you been working on an assembly, and then said, there's like an emotional gap here? Or what was your yeah, process? Yeah, yeah, no, great question. So I decided pretty early in the process that I thought we were gonna need that, because you know, a lot of times with historical archive-driven films, when when there's a personal story that's being told, the filmmaker will find archival, like let's say someone's telling, uh, you know, a personal anecdote that they were part of a protest, let's say. Well, the filmmaker will go, they, if they don't have the actual footage of the person in that situation, they'll go and they'll find footage uh, in, in that protest or a similar protest sometimes. <laughs> um, that could almost pass for it, and you know, there's a little bit of smoke and mirrors with it to, to kind of, you know, and it helps. It brings it to life, and it, but it's not really true mm -hmm. uh, in that way. A friend of mine says documentaries are a thousand lies, mm -hmm. in service of the truth, and uh, you know, some truth to that. Um, so, so, you know, I knew in this case though the specificity of these stories that they were telling, there would be no possible way to do anything like that. It didn't take long to figure out there was very little of Ted from that time. There was nothing of him from Los Alamos except his badge. <laughs> um, so I, I decided pretty early on, I feel like we, we have to do some kind of, um, you know, recreation uh, if we're going to bring this to life. And then the decision about what was brought to life, there were certain things that jumped out immediately, like the, the Rosenberg uh, going to the party the night of the Rosenberg execution. It was like, well, we're definitely going to do that. You know, there were, other, there were certain ones that just jumped out. It's like the FBI interrogation, you know, we're going to do that. But then there were others. But I was the editor on this film, so as, as I started to piece it together, mm -hmm. I, and someone gave me great advice who does this kind of stuff. Um, she said, don't shoot the recreation, shoot the recreations as late as possible in your process because you will, if you shoot them earlier and then you cut them out, you've wasted the money. You know, you cut out something like, oh, we didn't need that one, you know, it's better right. without it. Um, so I took that advice to heart and so we, we shot them in two stages because we needed the two different seasons, but um, we shot them fairly late in the process, and then I worked all those in, and then based on that, I thought of some others that I needed when we went back for the winter shoot for the for the cold weather stuff, and and shot them as well. So it kind of worked out in that way. I didn't do a lot of wasteful shooting. Did you enjoy that? I really, I really enjoyed it. Yeah, I really enjoyed it. It was fun. I mean, I I did some narrative stuff years ago. I did. This film called Prefontaine about yeah with um, Jared Leto, which was a real trip. Um, yeah, <laughs> when he when he great film. Yeah, when he got well, I don't know if it's a great film, but I thank you for saying that. Uh, yeah. <laughs> when he when he got when he got all the attention for uh, Dallas Buyers Club, you know, and then won yeah. the Oscar. Yeah, I was at a because uh, Prefontaine was the first feature film that he did. Up until then, he'd been on that show, My So Called Life. He hadn't been in a film yet, so that was his first film. And uh, so I was at an award ceremony because I had a film out around the same time, and I saw him walking across to go to the bathroom. So I got up, and I, I hadn't seen him in years, and I intercepted him, and I said, Jared, it's Steve. He goes, oh, hey. I go, I am so relieved that I did not destroy your career. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations on Dallas Price Club. <laughs> But um, but I've done I did some narrative stuff. I did a couple of TV movies as well back when TV movies were a hot thing to do. Um, but it had been a while, mm -hmm. and but it was fun to do it again, and and fun to do it in this, in this context. And I you know I decided to go for it. I I didn't want to do the just the obscured, um, artfully 
um, fuzzy or you know a lot of hands. Right, right. I, <laughs> I, I, I decided, fuck it, let's just go for it. Yeah, they're full on scenes. Yeah, yeah, and I, you know, and some people like that. There, you can, you don't have to, but you can go read some critics who don't like it and others who do. But I kind of knew that was what you're up for. I mean, yeah. it's just it's. It's such a knee-jerk thing in the doc world when you do that, you know. Uh, people have strong feelings about it. I knew that was going to happen, so I say fuck them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> one, I mean, we've sort of touched on this already, but one thing that really struck me in the film is there's like this evolving sense of, I, you know, moral decisions of like, or political decisions, like, they're, when they're talking about what happened when they were young and the decision to do this, and it seems very clear, like, oh, yes. it's coming from the right place and, and all that. And not that they contradict that later, but when they then talk about, well, then we found out about Stalin and what yeah. was going on, and n now we don't feel so good about the decision, or right. it's more, you know, it becomes more complicated. And then for the kids to have even more complicated views. Like, yes. Nothing is static or locked in place. Like, this is the right thing that happened. Yeah, no, absolutely. And, you know... It's funny because Joan is the most sure, right? She did, she's not the one that passed the secrets, although, but she played a, she saved Ted from himself on multiple occasions mm -hmm. and she was there for him through thick and thin. But she has a more, she has more assurance that what Ted did was right. And Ted, you see, you know, he, he had more doubts mm -hmm. about it. Um, and I loved seeing that difference. It's like, you know, I mean, Joan could acknowledge those doubts, but she always landed on, yeah, he did the right thing. Who was the soldier at the end who said should have taken him out and shot him? He, he, was, a, he was a scientist. He was. Uh, yeah, a did very prominent scientist. He's, he's considered yeah. the father of the neutron okay. bomb. Yeah, that's a pretty scary. Yeah, the father of the neutron bomb, which was, you know, a thousand Worse. times more powerful. Well, he must be a military man, then. He is. Was, I don't know if his background was military, but he was he was a he scientist. Did, I, yeah, okay. he was a scientist, yeah. and he may have I been a military man. I mean, I thought it was great you included him yeah. in the film. That yeah. voice needed to pop in there. Yeah, 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 absolutely. You know, the funny thing about it, we don't make a point of this in the film, but the funny thing about it is, is that if Ted had been convicted, it would not, he would not, been convicted of being a traitor, despite what the headlines said when it finally went public, because you can't be a traitor passing secrets to an ally. Oh. Right. That's his whole point, though, isn't it? Yeah. I'm sorry to interrupt. But that was the reason for right. this decision was, and it's true that the Russians saved Europe. They did. It's true. No, and, course, and, and, here in America, that's not the story. But No, not at all. I mean, you know. So an 18-year-old or a 19-year-old is very idealistic, you know, would think that way. Absolutely. And on campus, there were tons of organizations that were pro Absolutely, and pro-communist. Uh, you know, communism didn't have the at, at that time. It didn't. It it's before HUAC. It didn't have the 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 stink of right. of of what it came to have. Unfortunately, in the if he had not passed the secrets, it would have taken them years longer to develop the bomb. Yeah. However, Teller was there in the works, putting the screws to Oppenheimer and everyone else, so he could yeah. get the thermonuclear bomb. Yeah. Which was far. Far more destructive than they could ever have imagined. And yeah, the hydrogen the test bomb. Band treaty. Yeah, yeah, Ted. Um, he must have had regrets. You, you you say that he thought he was going to die before the the book came out, um, but why? Why did the, did they think there would be repercussions when the story came out while he was alive? He worried about it, but he was sick and dying. Yeah, uh, and. And, and, he, and he, knew, he knew that, you know, once those Venona documents were declassified 50 years later, that the press would seize on it, which they did, and there would be plenty of negative press, which there was. And so, you know, we don't include this in the, in the film, but Joe Albright showed up at his door in Cambridge, the author, co-author of Bombshell, who is actually was the husband of Madeleine Albright. Oh, oh wow! Yeah. They they were divorced, but they became divorced. But that's that's that connection. But um, but Joe, oh, there's a funny story with that too. Which, <laughs> but um, with, but Joe shows up at his door and says, "I want to be the one to tell your story 
your side of the story. And Ted initially rebuffed him. And then he left, and then he and Joan started talking about it. And then he decided to call, uh, you know, Joe left a phone number. And he decided to call him, and he said, I've changed my mind. And hmm. so, yeah, Bombshell was, in Ted's view, was his chance to do it. And, um, and he thought he would be gone before it was published so that there wouldn't be any real potential for uh, repercussions of them arresting and charging him in such late years. Um, again, not in the film, but Marcy and Joe, the authors of the book, um, their publisher was worried enough that that could happen, that they could go after them, that they had them send um, all of their tapes of their interviews with with uh, Ted and locate them on the Cayman Islands um, so that they would not be uh, accessible if, should they, you know, should, should the government decide to, uh, you know, demand them, so. But it would have been the Espionage Act. It would not traitor, but it would have been Espionage Act. Yeah, right? no. It, which is why. Exactly, the Espionage Act, Act absolutely. Yeah. yeah, guilty of espionage, which is, you know, the same thing happened to Klaus Fuchs in England, which was um, they brought him in for questioning too with the hopes that they could break him enough to give them the evidence they needed to convict him, and he broke. Mm -hmm. And so he ended up serving 14 years in prison. Mm -hmm. But Ted didn't break. And at a certain point, incredible, he realized after that first day of questioning, they didn't arrest me. They didn't arrest me, so why am I cooperating? I, I shouldn't cooperate. And, and when he got up to leave, he truly thought they were going to arrest him then, and they didn't. So that's when it, he knew that, okay, you know, he didn't know he was in the clear, but he knew that they didn't have what they needed in order to, to arrest him. They thought it was someone else, though, didn't they? I mean, Oppenheimer movie. Sure. And the and the op, yes the the yeah the the FBI didn't find out about uh, the CIA you know the intelligence and then the FBI didn't find out about Ted until uh, the U.S. broke the Venona Code the Soviet uh, wartime code which was considered impregnable unbreakable and it would have been unbreakable had it not been for a couple of lazy Soviet agents who didn't follow protocol and uh -huh. and because they didn't follow protocol. U.S. intelligence, it was still a, a major feat. They, they broke the code and, mm -hmm. and well, you know, it's said in the film, but one of the reasons they didn't want to, it's not, I don't think we do an honestly an adequate job of really teasing this out for you. Um, but, you know, they didn't want Ted to know that their source was the Venona code because they knew, mm -hmm. they knew that if, they knew that Ted was a spy, they knew it. You know, it wasn't a question of did he really spy. It was how are we going to get him. And they knew that if they, if he knew that they had broken the Venona Code, he, he might very well report that to his Soviet uh, connection. So, uh, and then Marcy um, Kunstel, one of the authors of Bombshell, says that the lead prosecutor in the FBI case, McQueen, who later became a judge. Uh, and he was, I would have interviewed him, but he had passed on. Um, but he said that there was no way they would have been able to use the Venona documents in court anyway. So they needed more than that. It's like they had, they knew what he did, but now they needed to be able to prove it without those documents. And they could not get, despite surveillance and threats and everything they did, they couldn't get what they needed. And by the time it was declassified, yeah, they could have gone after him then, but he was an old man and dying. Dying. Yeah. dying, so. Well, Steve, thank you so much for sharing the film with us and for being here. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for